Um, so the presentation is visible. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so I will talk about cryptocurrencies uh, in, in Africa. And I'd like to say I, I'm, I'm approaching this phenomenon from an anthropological perspective, maybe already historical, we'll see. Uh, but anthropological, it's, it's great to see, it's a great space to see uh, many classical anthropological themes, such as manias, fervors, just beliefs, even the circulation of prestige tokens, gambling, uh, divination, cosmologies of fortune. Um, but also it's turning out to be quite a central arena, already quite global one, in the generation of quite powerful new narratives and imaginaries that really express and channel uh, existing fissures and, and problems and contradictions on many levels. There's the whole anti-banking dimension since 2018. There's also some geopolitical dimensions. China seems to be at the forefront of the cryptocurrency phenomenon. And in Nigeria, which is the country I know best, uh, it's a very powerful point of tension between the government and its citizens and, and its monetary policy. Um, but it, it's a very curious phenomenon because in it you see a whole range of narratives from this promise of financial independence for individuals, for merchant networks, even for entire countries, um, to the promise of the end of wage labor and US dollar imperialism, um, to of course a lot of, uh, of well-reasoned uh, sometimes very worried, sometimes also a bit blind uh, dismissals of the phenomenon. Um, and it caught my interest uh, because since the phenomenon of cryptocurrency has, has kind of gone mainstream, it has generated a lot of reflections around categories of money and some genealogical redefinitions. Uh, what is a currency is credit simply a ledger, any ledger that is convertible to other established currencies. What is an asset outside of the real economy of production? Um, so all these uh, debates in monetary uh, theories and discussions are, are quite live. And I think a good way to visualize maybe these different layers of money um, is by using Lagos as a metaphor. So this is Lagos in Nigeria. And, um, and let's say the top is the, let's see here, the top, uh, the, the, the commercial sector of, of money production, the corporate and corporate ruled. Um, in Nigeria, the Western Union MoneyGram, which are these uh, remittance companies with a long history, uh, have basically an oligopoly. So they, they control remittances, money transfers from Nigeria to abroad. Um, but also in the kind of commercial private sector, there's a whole new uh, growth of startups in Lagos. It's becoming kind of the startup hub, the, the financial technology startup hub in Africa. So if we commonly associate you know, Kenya and Nairobi with kind of more humanitarian FinTech interventions that are also more corporate based. So it's a very well known example is uh, the Vodafone uh, version of in, in Kenya is called Safaricom. And they're basically the biggest bank in Kenya. They run a kind of mobile based um, uh, payment systems through their own systems, their own databases. A bit like WeChat in China, it's very mainstream. In Kenya, up to 80% of people use it. You can pay your taxi driver, your groceries, um, your family members in the village just with a message. Um, and Johannesburg, uh, of course, is the seat of institutional capital in Africa. With it's stock exchange, uh, it's, it's big firms, etc. But then Lagos is, is, is coming up to be the kind of a, a startup center. And maybe the middle layer, is the, the state, the state layer of money, um, which in Nigeria is obviously the central bank, the Naira is its unit of account, which it sets the exchange rate with the US dollar, which interestingly, I mean, Nigeria where I did my, some of my field work and archival work, uh, everyone knows the exchange rate and the history of the exchange rate. Uh, for example, in the 1980s, the golden period of the oil boom, the exchange rate was one to one to the dollar, it was pegged. Um, and now it's one to 400 and it's, it goes through different phases of devaluation and, and kind of fixed government kind of exchange rates. Um, so there's also a, um, a big pressure in, in, in demand for US dollar, uh, which is distributed by different uh, exchange bureaus. Every Monday they get a couple million US dollars and people can request them, but there's a huge demand for US dollars because Nigeria depends on imports. Um, so, it also puts pressure on the Naira. So there's also a huge black market, um, which, um, which is higher than the official market rate. So there's also a lot of the, 
these exchange different exchange rate uh, kind of tensions. And for example, here it's interesting. There's a nice quote that even the the central the the exchange bureaus of the government, when they run out of U.S. dollars for the week, they also kind of tell their customers, "Oh, just get Bitcoin instead. It's it's easier. If you need U.S. dollars, if you need, you need to pay a supplier abroad, or if you need to send money abroad for your children's tuition for uh, whatever, um, you can use Bitcoin." Um, this is from an interesting article about the. Nigeria emerging as a Bitcoin nation. Um, and then, so this has also created a whole series of brokers around uh, the different exchange rates. So traditionally it's based around mosques. Um, so if you, need, if you want US dollar or you need to get US dollar, you go to a mosque because the government issued ones are usually only for, there's a, lo a long queue and only the first in line get it. So uh, smaller scale merchants, they depend on kind of informal brokers um, that, are now also include crypto brokers. So people with WhatsApp, with Telegram groups, with reputation systems, um, they can kind of provide uh, access to US dollars or uh, stable coins, which is another phenomenon, which is also done with cryptocurrency, but it's not really linked to Bitcoin or other ones. Um, but yeah, so this, this phenomenon is unusually popular in countries with a big merchant uh, network and diaspora like Nigeria. And also countries with a floating currency. So this, this doesn't happen in, in French West and Central Africa, which has currencies that are pegged to the Euro, the, the Central African franc. Um, so it's, it, um, yeah, so, and then the, the bottom layer of money, which we can visualize here is the, the, the popular or informal, um, not, uh, not organizational. Um, but I would, I mean, I would locate the birth of Bitcoin and crypto in this bottom, uh, in this bottom area. Um, and also a lot of the, the use of Bitcoin now in, in places in, in Nigeria is, it, it's coming up from this kind of bottom up rather than from the kind of corporate or state uh, layer. Um, and then, yeah, and I mean, Nigeria, it, it's been surprisingly receptive to it because there's no real link to the Naira, so a lot of people don't pay taxes. There's also no, no income tax, rather. So there's no real need to hold the Naira. What's valued is goods and, and property. Um, and there's also no dependency on banks. So banks in Nigeria, they mostly loan, they create government bonds for the government, but they don't, they don't have consumer credit lines. Um, and, um, and Nigeria, it's also an unfortunate situation of being excluded from most of the global financial system. So you can't use MasterCard or Visa in, in Nigeria because of credit card fraud. They automatically block IP addresses that are based in Nigeria. Um, that's why a lot of Nigerian import works, you know, like in the in the in the old days. There's a merchant diaspora in Dubai, especially in Guangzhou in China, uh, where they carry sacks of cash, uh, maybe other valuables, exchange it through these informal networks. Um, and now I suppose since COVID they use, uh, I mean, you can still use Western Union, uh, Ali, Alibaba, which is the eBay for Chinese manufacturers, uh, they accept uh, Western Union transfers. But the problem with Western Union is they, um, they have high commissions, at least 8%, uh, and they have quite low limits. So a thousand for individuals, 10,000 if you're some kind of organization. So it's quite, it's, uh, the, the limits are very low. So this move to crypto also, uh, uh, to exceed these limits. Um, and how common is crypto? Well, here there's quite a the remarkable uh, fact that in Nigeria, a third of people have or, uh, or have used crypto in comparison to a single digit percentage in almost everywhere else. Um, so, I mean, I will talk specifically about the kind of social economics place of Bitcoin in, in a place like Nigeria. And maybe in the Q and A, we can discuss the different dimensions of the of maybe the technical sides, the the history of it, uh, the cryptography side of it. Uh, I mean, it is a huge phenomenon. The 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 founding paper of Bitcoin by this pseudonymous person called Satoshi Nakamoto. It has already fifteen thousand citations on Google Scholar, coming from computer science, legal studies, etc., uh, accounting. So it's it, it is of interest to in many different disciplines. Um, but I think it's uh, it's 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 kind of a, an ongoing phenomenon and a bit worrying because, on the one hand, it has also led to what I call this kind of uh, turmoil in existing 
long running orthodoxies of, of economic theory and even monetary policy, um, which has led to a kind of revived, revived rethinking by, by Keynesians, by different traditions, but also, also especially by, by libertarians who kind of drove Bitcoin at the beginning. Um, and then, and then, so I think it's, uh, it's, un it's, it's, it's unclear. So for example, policymakers, even the central bank in Nigeria, they, they categorically just say, you know, Bitcoin isn't money. Um, even Christine Lagarde said this recently as head of the European Central Bank, um, which, you know, it's unclear what it means. It means you can't pay your taxes in it. It means that Bitcoin doesn't create new money uh, through bonds or loans like central banks and commercial banks do. They, it's, it's effectively categorized by most regulators as a type of uh, maybe commodity, uh, collectible kind of quasi money, like monopoly money or, or, or internet game money. Sometimes also it's counterfeit money, illegal to use. Um, but the fact is that people are using it pragmatically as, as, as money. So, uh, you know, in Nigeria, people don't really care about the formal definitions, but it has, it has found a niche. Um, and that's what, that's what initially brought me to the topic or ha piqued my interest. Um, because even, even the, these big narratives around money, I mean, even Lagarde is head of the IMF. She was like, you know, maybe crypto is the next stage in the evolution of money if obviously it's managed and reapplied by, by banks and central banks in their own ways. Um, but I think unusual and quite extraordinary monetary phenomena happen a lot in African history. Um, for example, this is a scene from, from a market, from a money changer in Somaliland, which uh, entered a civil war in 1991. The central bank obviously ceased to exist. Um, and then what happened was that uh, forgers started importing from their own uh, printers the old currency um, and people knew it was fake uh, but they still used it as, as the currency in use and the, the price of the of the bill what it cost to produce was about three cents a bill and that was in the end the price of the shilling um, um, and Somalis had been using that for three decades this type of um, counterfeit uh, counterfeit money. So it's not actually a scene of hyperinflation, even though it looks like it. It's, it was quite a stable use of commodity money. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, for, so seeing this phenomenon from an African history perspective is, is curious because there's been a lot of phases of different phases of imported currencies, uh, high periods of instability, inflations, uh, substitutions of one currency by the other, which is kind of my ongoing research. I mean, the most famous of which is, of course, the, the cowries, um, which is still very much a remembered phenomenon in Africa. So this is the, the coin, the city in Ghana. This is the central bank in Benin. It has big cowries uh, on its facade. Um, and, uh, and its role in global history is, is, is I mean, it's not, it's not uh, it hasn't been studied as much as obviously the giant phenomenon of gold and silver and the role of South America, China, China and India in global history of, of different monies. But, um, if you look at the history of money from an African history perspective, one sees that the story has been kind of told a bit wrong. So the story has been usually of merchant exchange, a commodity exchange. So British merchants go to the West Coast and buy slaves and sell goods or buy palm oil and different, different items in the 19th century. Um, and what they sell were goods. The Europeans thought they were selling goods like cloths, alcohol, what was categorized as trinkets. Uh, which included things like glass beads, sundry items, even cowries um, weren't really seen as money, even though Europeans effectively were producing them. They were harvested from the Seychelles and other islands in the Indian Ocean. They're sea snails. Uh, literally billions of them over the centuries were, were, were harvested and sent to Africa. But Africans, they didn't really, they, it wasn't, they weren't consumers. It's not like these currencies were consumption goods. Uh, they were importing currencies for various complicated social reasons. Um, which is also what I study, which on the one hand, in some areas affected very much how the dynamics of the slave trade uh, unfolded. But it's curious because this is what sparked my interest in this because in Nigeria, uh, people have this background of African history and multiple currencies in mind. They very much see a continuity and even this kind of historical opportunity in these different types of currencies. So these are two crypto Bitcoin promoters, educators uh, in, um, in Lagos. And in their talks, which I saw online, 
they they talk about yeah our forefathers they spend monies in crypto you know sorry in cowries to buy goods you know why can't we use also money that isn't produced by the state to buy goods um, and this, this fellow on the right, uh, Joseph Tola, he says, you know, it's, it's a very old system, but digitally inclined. Uh, so there's this interesting kind of use of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the history here. And this is just to show the popularity of, 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 of Bitcoin as a search term in Google over time, uh, Ngram, on this Google search engine called, called Ngram. You can see the, the places where it's most popular. Number one is Nigeria. The top five African countries, that's Swaziland, Namibia, Lesotho, South Africa, which is really remarkable. Um, and I mean, one can also see in the graph that, you know, the first few years, it was really much, it was a very minor phenomenon. Uh, hackers, some underground markets around this type of uh, black market uh, eBay, like Silk Road, where you, you can buy drugs, et cetera. That, that was the kind of initial use case of Bitcoin. But also anthropologically, it spread. It spread through gifts. So initially, the miners who produced the new Bitcoin, they didn't have anywhere to spend it. So there's this. They were gifting it everywhere. Um, so that also gives some clues about the birth of an adoption of a currency, how it initially starts through these kind of giftings. Um, and obviously, it's unclear whether. I mean, it's quite clear that this is a bubble, and that there's another bubble approaching. Um, but it's unclear what type of bubble it is because it could be that it's like a like a dot com bubble or one of the many 19th century railway speculative bubbles, which led to kind of an amassment of capital capital and reconfigured infrastructure in the shape of the economy down the road, or it could be you know thinking of the 19th century again, uh, one of these bubbles that that blow out into, into nothing like the many colonial and concessionary ventures. That, was, that raised stocks with the promise of finding a new world, a new territory, new gold, new virtual terrains that ended up in, in nothing and colonization became much more uh, corporately managed and state controlled phenomenon, which could be what happens to crypto. Um, and then there was kind of, I mean, the whole phenomenon would seem to die out in 2014 because the main crypto exchange got hacked like uh, 1 million Bitcoin was stolen, 10% of all Bitcoin at the time. So it was abandoned. But then it was actually adopted by Chinese miners in 2014, 15, 16. Um, and they set up around the Three Gorges Dam where there was, a very, there was a very underused and cheap electricity. And they also used it to bypass their own currency control. So it became quite popular in China um, because they also invented this kind of new microprocessing chip that allows a faster mining of Bitcoin, not faster, but the guaranteed mining of it. So all the profits went to the miners. Um, so it became exclusively Chinese phenomenon for a few years. And then since 2006, 16, 17, it became quite a kind of global phenomenon for different reasons. And what it has enabled is a type of like, it's also a venture phenomenon. It, it enabled people who got in early to become independently wealthy and are now just spending all their time and resources promoting it, uh, spreading it, trying to get people to adopt it, et cetera. Uh, so there's a, there's a kind of an interesting kind of uh, phenomenon here. And then if we compare the youth the popularity of Bitcoin in Nigeria, you can see that the, the, the spike, this is the big global uh, spike in 2017, 18, but in Nigeria, there was already a spike before um, and a much higher spike in the past few years. And then this, this is very local detail. I won't really go into it, uh, just to say that in 2016, there was, a, there was basically a, a multi-level marketing scheme where uh, like a, a classic Ponzi scheme where you know, they, they promise 100% returns within the end of the month by getting new people. And at some point there was 3 million people in Nigeria in 2016 in this MMM constantly growing because it obviously is a pyramid scheme. And then the central bank in Nigeria banned the MMM and the bank accounts around the MMM. So they announced that they're gonna to move to Bitcoin. So suddenly 3 million people in Nigeria had Bitcoins. They had to figure out how to, uh, you know, the brokers, et cetera, how to buy and sell. Um, so it became this kind of, sort of rooted phenomenon. And also over here, you see some of these ongoing narrative issues uh, that, you know, they really do see uh, this is part of a technology of, of salvation, you know, or changing the world, taking power away from the central banks, etc. Um, so this is all kind of heavily in the mix. And then also the, there's all there's the practical side that I already talked about um, that I'll just 
you know, leave the, the titles of, of the, the press here. And it's also clear, if there's an interesting quote here from the Reuters piece, for example, a clothing merchant in Eastern Nigeria who buys from Istanbul and Shenzhen. Uh, he says, you know, well, he's quite happy with Bitcoin. He doesn't need to go to the banks. I don't need a person to use the back door to get dollars, which usually also involves higher commissions and kind of these local informal currency exchanges. So the curious place, the curious thing about Africa is that it's actually being used by kind of merchants, um, apart from the entire phenomenon of, of speculation, et cetera, which is a, a very clear one. But it, some of the other peaks of the past years has, has been the result of, for example, I mean, this existence of uh, amongst unemployed university graduates, tech savvy people in Lagos, et cetera, who go to meetups to learn independently how to trade and how to become brokers. But this has also been kind of heavily promoted by uh, you know, some high profile people like Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, who went to Lagos actually uh, for a few weeks to, try to join these meetups, et cetera, and promote Bitcoin. Um, and he also, an interesting quote, you know, Africa will define the Bitcoin future, et cetera. And then also over here, you can see, uh, you know, ordinary people also use it. And it's kind of unclear whether it's it's functional, but it's it's very much a, a set. It's a sign. It's it's a sign that you're. It's a kind of prestige token that you're tech savvy. Uh, you know uh, what Nigerians call futuristic, um, which they contrast with the kind of everything old and uh, especially the dragging them behind, which they see, which they usually responsabilize the government for. And I think I wanted to end there just just to say that even though the speculative dimension is clearly the, the dominant dimension now, um, I mean, speculative dimension in the sense that, you know, in a psychological sense, in a what psychologists call mimetic or recursive phenomenon, if, if they do this, then I do this. If people expect the price to go up, then I will also buy because it, it goes up. This is a kind of entirely psychological speculation phenomenon. But a lot of key, um, monetary phenomena are psychological. For example, rapid inflation, hyperinflations. If an exchange rate is worsening or depreciating enough, and enough people participate and see that the next day the exchange rate will be even worse, then before that happens, they'll convert their currency into to another more stable currency. And that's what leads to hyperinflation. That's what happened in Zimbabwe and Venezuela this century. Um, and since Bitcoin basically is a valve or a gateway to this type of uh, alternative currency very easily accessible, I really see the kind of phenomenon of Bitcoin as being quite destabilizing for places like Nigeria, which can kind of, um, I mean, it can probably become a kind of uh, the equivalent of like a Wuhan wet market of, of, a, of a global financial crisis, uh, which, you know, even the term contagion, financial contagion was coined after the Asian financial crisis, after the Thai baht was pegged to the dollar and it was devalued, lost 80% of its value. Um, and then that precipitated the financial crisis in a very unpredictable way. That's why they call it kind of financial contagion. So it's kind of, I mean, it's quite possible that Bitcoin and its kind of use will precipitate this type of uh, wider financial instability. So that's kind of my main conclusion and reflection. So with that, thank you. And I'll- uh... Thanks a lot, Enrique.